convention in mid year. So it's going to be in Las Vegas this year, starting July 30th to August 2nd. If you can go, I highly recommend it. Uh, first time I went last year, I was amazed. And um, professional development, we connect people to, to jobs, to um, other counseling for careers and all that. So we are a pretty big network. Uh, today is a special day. We have a very good group, and the subject is very focused. So uh, I want to challenge you, as you're listening to our presentation today, that you actually be very engaged. You usually have planned the questions. We kind of like help a little bit with the conversation. I want you to be engaged. So if you have any questions, I'm still learning about cryptocurrency. I don't know all that much about it. So take it the opportunity now to actually come out of here with knowledge uh, about that, especially within the Latino market. Um, we have a very special guest today that's going to talk to that. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite our guest speaker. Uh, come up to talk a little bit about the company. Sure. Um, so, so hi, guys. My name is Oscar Garcia. And uh, we're, we're going to, if you guys can hear me good, you guys can see that good, right? Yep. So I'm a son of an immigrant. How many of you guys can relate? Yeah? How you guys too, huh? So I was in the belly of my mom when she came over, and I got lucky and was born on this side of the fence. My, uh, my brothers and sisters were not, they were born on the other side of the fence, but my grandfather was a JAG officer for the United States Navy, and he helped start uh, Metcha. So I, I totally relate to what these organizations are doing and whatnot, how we're inspiring Latinos. That being said, I, I always said that there's a lack of Latino leadership to actually help businesses or, or young entrepreneurs grow. In the cryptocurrency space and blockchain space, it's even more prevalent. There's, there's not Latinos um, that speak, that are CEO Latinos or entrepreneur Latinos that speak in the cryptocurrency space. So our goal today is really hoping that as minorities, we can help each and every one of us actually grow because uh, we, were, we were just chatting about this you know, a little bit ago. Uh, there he is. Uh, so we were talking about the, the, the crab story. Have you guys heard the crab story? Or am I the only one? Yes, with it? I have. You, you right? It's like two buckets of crabs, the American crabs, you don't put a lid on, but the Latino crabs, you do put a lid on. So why do we put a lid on the Latino crabs? Because we'll hold each other back. There you go. See, I'm not the only one. <laughs> so, so my mom used to tell me that, right? As Latinos, we, we got to try to overcome these obstacles of, of, you know, holding each other back. Because we, I, I like the term you said, and I'm gonna coin him. He goes, we want people to do well, but not better. Is that close? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> so we want people to do well, but not better. Uh, I think that's bullshit. So let me uh, explain what I mean about this, right? So our goal as Latinos, if you really look at the ecosystem of Latinos, especially here with these organizations, we are entrepreneurs, right? Dreamers, I think I just got the numbers of how many dreamers actually own homes, and here's the exact numbers that a friend of mine in the real estate industry just gave me. 1.8 million dreamers ha have homes. It equals to $486 billion in the marketplace. That is strong, right? How many Latinos are you know, entrepreneurs, construction workers, doctors, teachers, lawyers, we're in finance, we're in hospitality, we're everywhere, yet we are not seen. And that was prevalent when Matt and I were at the Four Seasons, and we've seen Latinos everywhere, yet we're being ignored. We're being passed up. The ecosystem completely with Latinos, if you really look at it, you know, 57.5 million Latinos live in the United States that produce trillions of dollars in the marketplace. Yet the disrespect and the discourse and the attitudes right now with Latinos is beyond um, what most of us can take nowadays, right? This is why we need Latinos in the blockchain world because technology can actually help all of that. So some of the numbers that we always like to uh, uh, represent is that uh, despite the increase of social and economic advancement, or act, you know, there's, there's little access to banking that we have. Latinos are still uh, about 30% do not have access to credit cards compared to the regular demographic, about 20% of the, of the rest of the demographics don't have access to credit cards. 
So this is real prom, you know, a, a big issue in our space, and we want to obviously fix that. Yet, look what we have: smartphone adoption. Right? For us, uh, we really look at how much Latinos have embraced smartphones, and we've done it more than any other culture out there. We bypassed the laptops and went straight to the mobile phones. And that's what my mom never had a laptop. Yet she's on Facebook because I bought her an iPad. And she's on Facebook. The interesting part is my mom doesn't know how to spell. So it's total mocho, right? It's like, you know, te amo, mijo, right? And I'm like, okay, I get it. But moms and grandmothers, now because our grandchildren are on, you know, social media, they're really adopting this technology, you know, regardless of spelling, regardless of, of what they're doing, but they're really attempting to use uh, smartphone technology or non, uh, uh, non-traditional laptop technology, right? So how do we use this? The blockchain side of things really is what gives us the opportunity to build technologies for Latinos that are practical. I think too many times we hear the word blockchain and we instantly think Bitcoin, right? I mean, you guys, you know, like intermediate goal, those two words, right? Blockchain, Bitcoin. It's not, it's totally different. One's a currency, another one's a technology. And what we're always saying is, how do you use the technology to build practical products, practical apps? Because we all have ideas, but the problem is how, how practical can, there, you know, can it be? So the, the blockchain technology, right, let's, let's explain what it is. If I can find the cursor. Uh, let's explain what it is, so that way we can get a, a clear understanding of blockchain technology. As you can see here, the way blockchain works is there, there's, there's a transaction that happens. We're trying to disintermediate the middleman. That's what blockchain technology is doing, right? Transfer from one person to another person without the need of a bank, without the need of an authority figure. You are the authority. So the way the technology really works, and we have a lot of people you know, today here in the industry, is the way it works is you create a, a transaction, right? One person wants to send money to another person. So in this case, Alex wants to send money to Ben. Ben's over here. What happens? There's a block of code that actually gets generated. This block of code says that Alex wants to send one Bitcoin to Ben, right? And it gets transferred over here where miners can qualify that transaction. This is actually what's called mining. And we have someone that's actually a miner here that will talk more in details about this. But what happens is you have third party documentation that the amount of, of coins that she's sending is exactly what she's saying. And as long as there's a third party, someone that figures out the algorithm first that says yes, she is sending one Bitcoin to ban, that that instrument then comes over here, the transaction gets validated on a multi-ledger system. In other words, it's not tied to a single ledger. It's not tied to one bank account, right? It's tied to my ledger, her ledger, and someone else's ledger, and that makes it immutable. What does that mean? Okay, so let's try this out. I'm sorry, I forgot your first name. A niche, all right. This is a niche, right? Amanda, a niche. Uh, Amanda, you now know Anish. Let's say you guys have a relationship, right? I do not know Anish. But if my system says, hey, what's his name? And you tell me Anish, okay? She's an authority figure in my social media, and she's telling me his name is Anish. He's telling me his name is Anish. His name must be Anish. But if I have someone else, Ignacio, that says, hey, this is, this is Juan. And then our system goes, no, 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 Ignacio, you're wrong. This is Anish because there's two or three other people saying this is a niche. In other words, if he tries to change his name, the chain is broken. The immutability of all this is that multiple people can actually say that his name is a niche. Does that make sense? So the idea with this, as multiple chains, multiple systems are qualifying this transaction, it means it's always there, it gets put in the chain. That block is now verified, it gets put in the chain, Hence the whole thing of blockchain. That's it. That's it. It's really that simple. What can you do with that? You can do a lot of things. Because now do we really need authority figures to say that this is a niche, right? A niche is a niche because he has an ID. Who gave you the ID? California, right? Hopefully. I don't know. Do you have a driver's license? Yeah. Okay, so you're in the California driver's license system, right? Uh, you have a social. Okay, those are
our databases that are locked in in one centralized location. What happens if some hacker breaks into California DMV and changes his name? Could that happen? Yes, you've heard of Equifax, right? They got broken into. And that's what happens. When the database sits in one location, it's an easy target. Everyone's trying to go after it and they'll do whatever they can to break into that database and then manipulate it. Or the people who own the database manipulate it anyway. And we can get 5% of the 600 million into a credit worthy scenario. We can actually bring $6 trillion of new money into the marketplace. But that means we need technology to rise the culture. We need technology that can help track the good people that we are. Right? And here's what we mean about that. The biggest problem with the Latino culture is we're not part of the formal economy. There is no real database out there that's actually saying that, you know, Amanda or Juan or Oscar, that they know exactly what we buy when we buy. There's not a database like that. The databases that exist right now are very broad. They said, okay, I bought them because, you know, someone showed me that their drill had more RPMs than my other one, so I bought another drill, right? So, but we buy things over and over. We're consumers. Latinos are consumers. We're constantly consuming things. And we might not consume entertainment as much, but we consume everything else more than any other demographic. And that's something that that, that database does not exist out there. And the other problem is, how can we buy anything from Amazon if we're a cash-based society? That's the problem. My, my uh, uh, godfather, my padrino, for those of you guys that speak Spanish, um, he makes $6,000 a weekend selling tacos. It's all cash. Oh, you're smiling. You're, you got family members like that too? No? <laughs> right? My mom is Marta. And my mom had this problem. As I was growing up, I was the line holder guy in my family. They put me in lines, right? We went to the grocery store, stand in line, people. Oh, were you that guy too, right? It's like stand in line, and there's like five, you know, there's like 10, 20 people on the line, and I'm standing, I'm a little kid, okay, mom, uh, what am I gonna buy? No más, ponte en línea. And I would get to the front of the line, and, and if, if they don't get back, I would have to buy like a freaking Yorks, right? I'm like, shit, you know, I'm, I'm in front of the line, so it's better than my mama, okay, quieres comprar un York, two Yorks. <laughs> so I would buy whatever, but most of the time I didn't know that I was in line because my mom was cashing her check <clears throat> or my mom was paying her bills. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have enough money for bread sometimes because they were charged her fees. That's bullshit. Spain uh, Olympics. I was the kid that cracked his head open right before the Olympic Games, but I was a Latino American trying to become an Olympian. And I met a millionaire back then, and I brought him coffee for four years, and this guy made $300 million right in front of my eyes, and I learned his business techniques by bringing him coffee. We are Latinos. We keep on working no matter what happens. And I became an entrepreneur at age 18 because of that man, and I've made millions of dollars in my career, and I've lost millions of dollars in my career, but we were entrepreneurs because we got mad because I never, ever, ever didn't want enough money for bread. That's why we did it, right? But look at the fundamental problems of our culture. We get beat to death. We're the lowest person in the totem pole and yet we're kicked. It's like $15 to send $200 just to Mexico. It's electronic, guys. It shouldn't cost that much. That's what technology is all about, right? It brings down the cost of everything. Bank accounts at $29 a month, and people say, well, it's $29 a month. You know my bank account is free? Why? Because I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in my bank account mm -hmm. now. But when I didn't, it was $29 a month. And what I did is, I don't know about you guys, but I used to pop in my ATM and pray to God that there was money in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did that too, right? It's like, no, no, necesito más otros 20 dólares. And I had no idea how the 20 dollars were going to get in there, but I prayed to the, you know, I don't know, a leprechaun or something to put 20 bucks in my, in my account. And what happened? The exact opposite. I got a fee for $35 because I was overdraft. And then I got another $35 fee because I didn't handle the first fee fast enough. By the time a coffee cup, because we're trying to kickstart our credit, that is a major problem. So in-store credit. And then finally, what we're talking about, the sheer disrespect that we feel and the sheer intimidation that we feel when we walk into a branch. 
And if you haven't felt that, you have no idea what we're talking about. Because who the heck is that bank branch manager and the teller anyway? And why do we fear them? Why? Why did my mom fear a cop pulling her over even after she got her papers? That's how we are. We're Latinos and we got that fear inside of us and we must take that away. Technology, technology can do this. So here's, here's what we're always you know, talking about and, and we've gone through some of these numbers by these transactions. So we had to solve two problems and we use blockchain technology in order to do this. The first problem that we solved is the, the financial tool to load money into the platform. See, traditionally you go to a bank account, you go to a bank and you load money you know, into your, your bank account so you can have access to, of it through your Visa MasterCard, right? There's other ways to do it. You can go to a 7-Eleven, they have rails. You can go to Walgreens, there's green dot rails where you can load money into a card. But what we did using blockchain technology and how we figured it, uh, there's a picture that's missing, that's a picture of Maria right here. Uh, what happened is we created our own uh, system to actually load cash money into the platform. It's a peer-to-peer -peer banking system using smart contracts. So think about it. If we're talking about immutability of a contract, what we had to do in order to show that has money into the bank, then she can reduce her cost financially. In other words, Walmart charges you a fee to pay your bills. We don't, we revenue share with our customer. So we're saying to Maria, look, now that you have money in the system, pay your bills, but the model changes. We say, we'll revenue share with you because these companies pay us money to collect their money. So we're gonna split it with Maria, right? So she's doing the right thing. We're tracking what she's doing and we're tracking how much she's doing. Now if she wants to send money, we actually invented our own rails to send money. There's three different ways to send money. The analog way, Western Union MoneyGram. There's the ACHs and wires, right? Semi uh, uh, technology way and what have you. And then you can do cryptocurrency or a hybrid of it. All those three things start reducing the cost. The more human beings touch it, the more the costs go up. By the time we get to cryptocurrency, we can go down to a fee. Our hard cost might be 60 cents. We can obviously then just bump it up to a dollar and have Maria send up to $300 for a buck, which is a lot better than any other technology. Does that make sense? But when the technology is not available to do cryptocurrency and we have to do analog, then that's what we have to do for that country. Maria doesn't care. As long as the money gets to wherever Maria wants to get to, that's what Maria gives, you know, cares about, right? So that's what we're saying. Technology should be invisible. It should just be able to help Maria accomplish what she's trying to do. That's all we're saying. So we track all those things. We track your bill pay, we track your remittance, uh, and then what we do is we use that data to actually create our own microcredit ledger. Now again, this is all on our blockchain. Why? Because these transactions are immutable. They're being verified. So we can go to financial partners and say, look, the way we're tracking this is we got X amount of credit factors and we got X amount of social media factors that combine together that tells us that Maria is good for a $50 microloan or Maria is good for a $20 microloan. But that wasn't enough. Using blockchain technology, we can then create a, this, this is, for us this is exciting because if you decentralize microcredit financial products, you can give the power of anyone to give anyone a micro loan. So what we did is this. We gave a platform that's completely decentralized that we say if she has a grocery store, she can come up with her own financial credit lines to consumers. She can say, I will give customers a $10 microcredit loan that if they accept it, or in this case $15, if they accept it, the next time she loads money into the system, right? Now what, what our system does is actually sees that what kind of credit offers Maria can afford. So if Maria can afford $15, we're gonna show her that offer from her store. But if she can't, we will not, because we don't want to overextend her, right? And again, that can be done through blockchain technology and decentralization databases, because we're tracking what she does. So think about it. If she's offering her $15 and she can afford it, then when Maria does her next direct deposit into the system, we remind her to pay that merchant, and we tell her if you do, you get access to more credit lines. We give her a reason to do it. Right now, there is no reason for you to use your banking app, but once a month. Right? 
if we gamify it and show Maria that she's actually earning more credit points and she can actually open up more financial opportunities, she will do it. And then we, we work with that. Latinos in general, if you look at the numbers on collection agencies, we pay back 98% of the time. So our risk factor on loans is very low, as long as you give us a payment plan. And that's what we're doing here. So our smart contracts are saying, she, Maria owes someone $15, and we're gonna help Maria pay that $5 at a time until she's paid back, and all of a sudden we can prove that Maria is credit worthy up to double that amount of money, 30 bucks. Does that make sense? So how many microcredit offers can businesses have? As many as they want. The whole point is, this is a decentralized uh, program where we can replicate this entire program into other countries. So we can have every business out there offer microcredit financial tools and they control the terms, the times, and the percentages. It's their, it's their financial instrument. So that was exciting for us using blockchain technology. So we're working on digital content, microcredit offers. And think about this. Right now, the business model of a Netflix and a Hulu is, if you have a debit card, you can do a free trial, and then it goes into a premium trial. Okay, Latinos are cash-based consumers, so how do we take advantage of that? We can't, we can't. So here, what we're saying is, we're saying Netflix, instead of offering people that, offer them a credit line and let our product help you pay off that credit line. They still get the same offer, but all of a sudden it's a win-win for the business. It's not a negative marketing dollar uh, on their books, it's a positive credit dollar on their books. We're in an accounting firm. So for you accountants, figure that one out, right? If we can turn a, a credit line into a positive, where, where usually marketing dollars is a negative in accounting, right? Because, hey, how much, uh, what's the uh, cost for uh, customer acquisition, right? Most companies, like in merchant services, our cost was 50 bucks to $150 to acquire a customer. That could be a negative in our books because sometimes we acquired a customer, sometimes it didn't. Here, if it's a credit line, it's a collectible. It's still good. It's still good, it's still a positive. So that's how we did it. That's what we built using blockchain technology. We eliminated as many middlemen and we used smart contracts to facilitate things for the merchants. And then what we did in order to grow tack this thing is that four years ago, uh, we were involved in the company where we brought in a lot of Latino businesses into merchant services. We actually ended up doing $60 million in revenue in under nine months. I made millions of dollars, I lost millions of dollars. But it proved the point that if you offer a product to consumer, to Latino owned or minority owned businesses, you can scale up quite rapidly. We actually did $60 million in revenue in nine months. So what we did, we went back to our B2B partners and identified which partners dealt with the Latino market. And we found them, right? It's your Amways of the world. It's your insurance companies of the world. It's your HR companies. It's the granjeros. It's your unions, right? It's all these people that need to pay people. If our system can lower the cost to pay out your people, and at the same time offer them microcredit loans using our, our formula, then it's a win-win for the per person you're paying and for uh, our platform and for the company, right? And that's the goal of technology. If we can lower costs but increase you know, volume, then we can all win. So that's how we did that. And, and obviously we have a lot of you know, great people that work with us. Uh, Frank DeCreasy, who's been with Merrick Bank and Visa MasterCards, our COO. Uh, this great guy, he, he's, he's white though, you know, Matthew, <laughs> you know. So we had to sprinkle in a white guy here and there, right? But our, our yeah, 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 if you meet him, he's yeah. a real cool guy though. So, uh, uh, yeah, he's right here. So uh, Alan, our CTO, has built eight different FinTech products. His last FinTech product, or one of the last FinTech products, the United States government bought it out. He actually created a formula that actually tracks whether people using remittance are, are drug dealers, uh, terrorists, or something bad. And he can actually track it by IP address and actually formulating those things. So one of the things you have to do as entrepreneurs is you gotta surround yourself with really good people that are driven with your cause. But one of the most important things to do as entrepreneurs is kick out the people who are not. And I'm gonna say this over and over again. It's not important, it's more important to kick out the negative people, the people who are holding you back, 
the people who don't want to push your agenda, it's more important to kick them out than to bring in good people. Because you've, always, you've heard the term, right? A bad apple spoils the bunch. It's worse than that. It's worse than that. It's freaking cancer. It's cancer. You waste your time. You waste other people's time. You waste money. And more importantly, you kill your heart. Because how much push can you have, right? How much push can you have? How much drive can you have when you come home to a nagging wife? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to an nagging partner. <laughs> I'm sorry. I say that because I got divorced, <laughs> and six months later I was a millionaire. So, <laughs> so sometimes you know, uh, uh, it, it's it's get rid of the people you're the, you're literally with. <laughs> but it's so true. It's so true. You you gotta you know. And some of you guys, God bless you. You're with wives that support you. I hate you. Uh, you're with <laughs> wives that love you. I hate you. Uh, you're with uh, significant others that are amazing, right? And I hate you. But some of us do not have that. Some of us picked wrong. And just because you picked wrong doesn't mean you have to stay there. You can move. And that's so true with relationships, and that's so true with business relationships, right? I'm not the best at a lot of things. I'm probably a decent talking head. I'm probably a decent, passionate person, but... You can't spell. I can't spell for shit. <laughs> right, let's, let's get that out of the way. I can't, don't, don't make me spell anything, right? But I got people that are phenomenal, that, that literally fill in the holes of what you're not good at, right? Find those individuals. In the case with blockchain technology, it's so new, you can literally become the expert within three to four months. But you gotta just bury yourself in this technology. You gotta bury yourself in everything. You gotta learn this thing better than the next guy. But if you do, and when you do, and you come up with your idea using blockchain technology to benefit society, what can you not do, right? And there may be people, whether it's investors or contributors or what have you, that may understand you or may not. Who cares? As long as you have a noble cause to use technology to, to rise a culture or to rise someone, then you can use technology to do that. But that is my goal, right? My goal is to show you what we've done, to tell you the obstacles, because they were doubters. There was a lot of doubters, but we kept on going. We kept on going, and now we have it. And our contracts that we have, I can't even tell you what's gonna happen on Tuesday. But I wish I could, <laughs> because there is government agency signing contracts with us right yeah. now because we kept on going, we kept on pushing, we kept on building something, right? You may be misunderstood sometimes. You may be forgotten sometimes, but don't lose your passion and keep on bringing in the people. So I'll end with this, and I promised my mom I was going to say this, right? Okay, hold on, hold on. I'm going I'm to go Facebook Live here because I promised my mom, all right? Okay, here, 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 here it is. Okay, so what happened to my mom is, uh, today's my mom's birthday. <laughs> so, so today's my mom's birthday. Um, starting live video, okay, here, here it is. Okay, mom, this is for you. Okay, uh, I'm in a room with a bunch of Latinos, say hi. Hola. Okay. Hey, hola, mom. <laughs> so, so, mi mamá, my mom, um, is pissed off. 40 años, 40 years she worked to become a citizen of the United States just to get disrespected by el trompudo, right? <laughs> and she said today, she goes, ¿Por qué trabajé por 40 años para ser mi ciudadana, para que este hijo de Zoom, right? She said that, me llame mierda. <laughs> él es mierda, mi hijo. Dile a la gente que él es mierda, que los latinos no somos malos, somos buenos, right? She said Latinos are good, mm -hmm. we're not pieces of whatever, you know what he said, with Salvadorians and other countries. And she said, look, what if we can actually change that attitude? How can we change that attitude? And she said something really important. She said, I feel that my vote and my money is not welcomed in the United States. How sad, huh? And I said, mama, do not stop voting with your vote and your dollars. Tu dinero es tu voto. Use your money to cultures or businesses that support Latinos, and we will rise. And the more we rise, the more we can lift others up, right? Let's stop being the crabs that pull Latinos down, and let's start helping people get out of the bucket, whether we make it or not. Fair enough? Thank you very much, True. Mama. That was for you. <laughs>
dropped a lot of really good uh, nuggets of wisdom there and uh, so many so many things we could talk about and we can get a little more into that but uh, just what an exciting space with this technology and and the opportunities that it's creating for for everyone and I think we're just scratching the surface now of what technology can do so it's it's interesting what what is this world going to be like 10 years from now 20 years from now when some of this technology takes hold. Uh, I've heard people talk about the internet, uh, the, when the internet first originated and people were using dial-up uh, AOL, I don't know if you guys were old enough, to the 56K modem and you know, now looking at what technology and we've got everything on our phone and, and it's just, it's, it's gonna be mind-boggling what, what this technology is gonna do for multiple industries 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So, Oscar, thank you for sharing, um, and uh, we're gonna get a little deeper into this over this panel. So just a quick few words about myself. My name's Ignacio Griego. I'm an assurance partner, an audit partner here in BDO, uh, San Francisco practice. I've got into the crypto space and the blockchain space. It's been very recent, actually, and I think what Oscar mentioned, uh, if you really dive into it and, and uh, become an expert, you really can, gain that knowledge and become an expert in a, in a relatively short amount of time because this industry is so new. So myself, I've only been in the industry for about a year and a half. We work with investment funds that are investing in cryptocurrency uh, as well as blockchain companies. We work with mining companies and broker dealers who are in the space as well as companies who are looking into doing ICOs who are, or who have done ICOs. Um, so that that's myself, and uh, I guess we'll let you. You all know Oscar now. Uh, we'll let the other panelists uh, spend a few minutes just introducing themselves, and uh, maybe just talking a little bit about what you're doing in the space and how you got into the space. Um, so why don't we start off with Anish? Sure. So um, so I've been in the space for about five years, and um, I kind of come at it with with from all sides. So. I do a little bit of investing. I, I manage crypto portfolios for, for multiple investors. Um, I do mining, so I have mining farms. I'm originally from Canada, so I have a mining farm in Canada. I have, um, I'm setting up a new farm here. And at the same time, I'll, I'm also dev um, delving into to smart contract development. And um, so kind of getting at it from all aspects, um, that's kind of the general gist of okay. my brain. Um, sure. <clears throat> so I guess I've been in the space now be about a year and a half, two years. Uh, actually, academia pushed me into the space. I uh, got my executive MBA from Washington State University, where I ran an ICO feasibility study. And it was really to look at this fundraising mechanism and how it will really challenge the VC world. And it's funny, you know, it's having this conversation in San Francisco where there's so much VC funds everywhere. But if we look at how ICOs are working now and how public token sales are working now. It's very quintessential innovator's dilemma from a disruptive technology standpoint, but to the fundraising vehicle for organizations. Uh, from that as well, uh, I write for a lot of different crypto news outlets. Uh, I have a radio show on WCKG Chicago called Crypto on the Block. That's also syndicated on iHeartRadio. Um, obviously, I'm the CMO of Ula La. I've consulted on half a dozen and a dozen more in the queue on, on ICOs, clients around the world. I was telling Oscar today, I had clients flying to San Francisco yesterday from Singapore and Sydney and booked me for the day to have a conversation for their ICOs. There's a lot of innovative projects going on here around the world, a lot of great entrepreneurs, and I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I get to meet a lot of them. So uh, with that as well, is I, I did co-found the, the crypto business forum at NASDAQ. That's happening in a few weeks as well. Uh, which is going to be 
uh, quite the splash on the scene, which, which should be a lot of fun. But so that's kind of where I'm what I'm doing. Great, thank you, Matt. Before we get started, just quick show of hands. How many of you guys actually own cryptocurrency? Just quick raise of hands. Okay. How many of you have considered, if you don't own, considered getting into the space and buying some? Okay, so good, pretty much most of this room either has cryptocurrency or has thought of it. Uh, maybe we can start off, I, I think everyone's heard of Bitcoin at this point, but there's a lot of cryptocurrencies out there, and maybe we could just start off with the basics, uh, and we can ask Anish, uh, what are some of the basic cryptocurrencies out there, and you know, why, is, why is there a need for multiple cryptocurrencies? So, I mean, a, a blockchain can do can do a lot of things. Um, it, it primarily acts as a transactional ledger, but but it, it allows for many different things. So, to give you an example, I would say Bitcoin is kind of like a crypto asset. It's kind of like digital gold. You have um, Ethereum kind of working in the smart contract space, so it's doing it's doing kind of law. You have things like Filecoin, which are kind of doing file storage, decentralized. You have you have uh, a blockchain like Aragon that's trying to do uh, governance on, at a decentralized scale. So it's not only just money that you can transact on a blockchain, you can do a lot more things uh, with the core fundamentals being, you know, it's decentralized, it's immutable, it's borderless, um, and, and, and that's not limited to, to, just, to just being currency. And so that's kind of the need for, for multiple different blockchains. And I mean, at the top there, you have kind of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, but then there's, there's a range of blockchains in the middle that, that are kind of at the intermediate stage, like Zcash, Monero, these ones, they're, they're kind of, they're not mainstream, but they're still fulfilling a purpose. And then you have some really, really new currencies, uh, like ICOs that are coming out, um, and, and it's interesting every day, you, you find out more and more. It's a perfect segue. Matt, uh, ICOs, so, uh, let's talk a little bit about initial coin offerings. They've been in the news quite a bit this last year. Regulators are really interested in the space. Uh, are these things securities? Are they not? Uh, there's, there's so many of these out there, people looking to raise money, disrupt the traditional venture and seed funding. Um, what do you look for when you're, when you're looking at these as potential investments? Um, great question. <laughs> Especially for everyone that's looking to purchase, you know, cryptocurrency. If you haven't done so already, etc. How do you, how do you evaluate a project? Is kind of the I think the, the biggest thing. Yeah, maybe we could even back up. What is an what is an ICO? Yeah, so an ICO stands for initial coin offering. So uh, similar to how companies go public with an IPO. So there's there's very very large differences between the two. So a company who's doing an ICO does not give away equity in their company with an ICO, okay? So from a organizational standpoint, if I wanna raise capital, I can do so without diluting my ownership percentage in my company, which is fabulous from a ownership standpoint from a company. From an investor standpoint, they have almost immediate liquidity in most cases on that token, which means they can get their money out. Now, if we look at this from a ICO or IPO world, most companies that are doing an ICO would be equivalent to like a seed round for the VC, which is like the first round money for most instances. Now in the VC world, if you're putting in money in a seed round, well that's great, you put me half a million, million dollars in, right? And that company's gonna need another three million in a couple of years. And another three million in a couple of years past that. And then maybe another you know, five million past that, and then maybe go to an IPO. Well as an investor, I'm waiting eight years to get my money out maybe more. Well, an investor in an ICO, typically the, the process might run five months, could go on some like a third party exchange where then I can maybe sell some of those, those tokens and I have a, kind of immediate access to that if there is an increase in the market and so forth. So it gives me a, a much better way to get you know, my money back out of my investment as well. Are there any questions right now on what's been discussed on ICOs or, yeah. I have a question about the mining farm that you have. Sure. Like what, what exactly in your day to day, they, you know, uh, the miners do? So. Yeah, she might be thinking that miners are people. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
like one way to put it is, let's say you go to the grocery store, right? And you put your Visa card into like a cash machine. And you say, I wanna transfer some money from myself to the store. Well, someone's actually making that change, right? He's moving money from your account into the store. Well, who's doing that? If you're using Visa, then Visa's doing it. Now, why would Visa do it? They're not doing it for free. They're getting paid. Now, in a blockchain, nobody owns the blockchain, so who's, who's processing the transaction? Nobody owns it. So that's where the miners come in. The miners provide a service. They're processing your transaction. So if you want to uh, move Bitcoin, they would actually process your transaction. They would send money from your account to another account. And for, and for providing that service, they get paid. They get paid in the sense that they are allowed to print a regulated amount of Bitcoin. If it was Ethereum, they would be allowed to print a regulated amount of Ethereum. So miners are providing a service. They're, they're upholding the network and they're moving money around. So, okay. so if I say run a mom and pop shop, right, very small scale, and, but the service itself, like how much would it cost to, to get into the, mm. you know, to use the blockchain service? I'm just curious, is it something that... Too much. Yeah, yeah for, for, for now it's too much. Um, <laughs> especially, like it depends on what blockchain you're using. So for example, on Bitcoin, it'll, it'll cost you a lot of money, but there are methods being developed that want to really, really lower transaction costs. Things like the Lightning Network that that will lower costs significantly and, and increase the volume like huge. But these things are being worked on. For now, it's not feasible. See, people talk about Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency and I don't see it that way. Because if it was a currency, you would use it for store payments, right? But you can, it's too expensive. I consider it like gold. You don't go to store to like mm. pay them in gold. It's, it's just too expensive, you wouldn't do that. So it's more of a crypto asset. You can't think of Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, but at a technical level, you could. If you're willing to pay that price, you could go to the store and you could pay them Bitcoin, and some stores do do that. If, if you don't mind me putting this in two cents, that, that, that was the problem when we were looking at it because we're, we're in the merchant service space. Um, you know, Matt and I own several different businesses. It actually got me involved in the brewery. I don't know anything about beer. But in the merchant service <laughs> side of it, um, the transactions are, are almost immediate, right? Because Visa MasterCard has a network of banks. As, as the miners are growing, they're actually the ones who, who are telling us how expensive it is um, for like a Bitcoin. A Litecoin is actually less expensive. Yeah. Uh, EOS is even less expensive. That's, that's one that we were looking at as well at block one. So what happens uh, with merchants until that gets resolved um, you're gonna stand there was a time where it took me three days to get a Bitcoin So go go to a Starbucks and get a coffee lacho Whatever you get, you know 120 degrees and wait three days to pay them. It, it ain't gonna work So he is so right about that and I think this, we were talking about this earlier the terminology matters um, And because this is a new technology remember AOL And on and on and on for like a minute or two, right? That's blockchain right now that's crypto right now. Mm -hmm. But now, what are we doing? 5G's coming out, right? That's what we're waiting for. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's an interesting perspective, what's going on here. I know in other parts of the world uh, where their banking system may not be as, uh, as advanced as what's in the US, uh, other people have adopted some of these cryptocurrencies. Would any of you care to comment on you know, what you guys have seen in other parts of the world? I, and maybe you can get into a little bit about um, the mining in Canada, but uh, just in, a, in other parts of the world, uh, cryptocurrency and the blockchain are also taking off. And in some instances, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's even more advanced and more ingrained in, in society. So I'm interested to hear any of your comments on, on that. Well, we learned, if you don't mind me going first, uh, we learned from Africa. In Africa, it's, it's mobile, um, who was that? Uh, M-Pesa. So M-Pesa, there's no currency over there in Africa in some countries, so they were paying mobile to mobile you know, transactions. Yeah. And that was really the catalyst. Uh, if, you, if you look at really the, the scalability of cryptocurrency, it's, it's really been around for decades. It's just been fleshed out you know, with, uh, uh, in 2008 after the, the economy collapsed. But M-Pesa um, really set us up for, for mobile devices. 
So, so really when you look at the old technology of anything, right, is VCRs, what was that before that was beta, right? And then VCRs and then CDs and then DVDs and now it's all USB. That's what's happening here, right? The dollar has gone from the gold standard from, you know, from 1973 to no standard that's just backed by the trust of the US government uh, to cryptocurrency backed by the trust of the people. That, that's really how we look at it. So for us, the, the goal is gonna be to learn from the companies or from the mechanisms that were there before and then just advance that, you know, push that out in a practical way, right? If we can, uh, cell phones were this big and now look at us, right? And it was only a phone. I mean, how weird is that, right? Now this thing is everything, a GPS, a phone, a social media device, a calculator, uh, you know, everything. And, and that's what we're saying cryptocurrency should be. And there's some industries that grow faster than others. Uh, for us in the banking world, we're 10, 20 years behind every other industry. So that's how we look at it. You know, I'm not sure how you guys look at it in the mining. Um, on the mining side, I mean, it, it all depends. So at a, the, the original blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, the, these are kind of fundamentally global. So mm -hmm. you have miners all the, over the world. Um, the environment for mining totally depends on how much electricity costs, because to run mm -hmm. a miner, you need, you need electricity. So in some places it, it is cheaper and, and hence more prevalent. Um, it also, the climate matters a lot. These machines produce a lot of heat. So if, so if your, the climate's hot and the machine's producing heat, you gotta cool it, that requires electricity. So in Canada, it's cold, and, and more and more you're seeing mining farms come up um, down there. Uh, and, and kind of speaking to the, the cryptocurrencies in different markets, I think um, there are, you know, a lot, of, a lot of development has happened in like North, like the US and, and Europe. And I think there are blockchains that need to suit the, you know, the cultures and the markets in certain countries, you know? You can't have maybe a one size, size fits all. And, and, and if, yeah, like a system like ooh la la. Um, and, and these can interact with like the global blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, so I think you do need some blockchains that are, that are kind of catered to a certain market. Um, and then they can interact, interact with the global blockchains. Yeah, in our case, we actually did do that. We, we built a bank core logic system that we can integrate down the road with Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum and whatnot, because we know it's gonna get to that level. So we actually built our technology knowing that it, it, it took longer, but we know it's gonna go down that road, right? So we're getting ready for it. That way we can present to you the products and services that we want to push out to you, right? Like I said, if she owns a store and she wants to push out the ability to pay her on crypto, we can push out only to her customers that capability. But we had, to, we had to look at the market and say, will it go down that road? And we said, yes, so let's build that first. Whether we initiate it or not, you know, that, that's up to us. Matt? Yeah. Uh, I think part of the original question too was, <clears throat> what areas of the world are really diving head first into <coughs> blockchain? So if we look at, you know, Dubai, for example, mm -hmm. right? All their government services are on blockchain. Think about that for a second. Think of if social security in the US was then run on blockchain, or we able to track health records in for people on blockchain. Like I, again, like I'm in a position where I speak with a lot of different innovators every day. A gentleman I spoke with uh, two days ago, he's the CEO of a company called Impact PPA. And so what they're doing, they're taking renewable energy into the remote regions of the world on blockchain and they're building a, a payment network for that, similar using in Africa they're starting, so be, be using the M-Pesa system very similar where they can take SMS payment, but regulated on a blockchain where they've taken the energy in to fund a renewable energy system for that remote region. It's a closed loop system that funds itself and people are paying for their energy bill with their phone. Instead of using a third party, like in yeah. our bill pay system, mm -hmm. try to pay your electrical bill on, on online. It's, There's, there, it's a third party that charges you two bucks just to pay your own electrical bill. Yeah. Right? Oh, you, you pay for $2? Yeah. Stop. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what we're saying, you know. Here, here's us, actually, when you look at it at a practical pace, and, you know, Matt always tells me about these companies, I'm like, cool, that's going to take the place of that. Uh, 
we, we want to look for those opportunities or those opportunities are available for you to solve, right? That's the whole point. It's like how many of these things can you solve using blockchain technology based on your backgrounds and, and what you are. You guys are engineers, accountants, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, just people. But it, it takes a person with an idea to implement this technology that, that really can solve a problem. That's a good point as well when I, I like to evaluate projects. So that was a part of the question earlier too is, is there a real business case mm -hmm. for this company to even exist? Yeah. Right? If I take the word blockchain away from your business, does it make sense? Right. Like, are you just kind of after a little cash grab with an ICO, right? Or are you actually going to be here, driving innovation, having customers? Do you have a revenue roadmap for your business? Like, all these things matter if you're going to evaluate a project where you're going to invest in, per se, or buy their their tokens and so forth. And obviously, take a look at their team members, their executive team. You know, make sure they're real people. We just had a scam ICO the other day. I had a picture of Ryan Gosselin as their as their head designer, um, but they, they ran off with eight hundred thirty four thousand dollars of people's money because people don't do their due diligence, right? They don't they don't look at and evaluate a project for what it should be, and not just think, oh, this is really cool. It's, I saw some hype on the media. Let me go put a Bitcoin in there. Like, no, like do your due diligence. You know, look at this as an investment in a digital asset, as Denise said. Great point. Do you have a question? Yes. My question is more around the actual technology, um, so around the crypto authorization. Because earlier you were saying how there was like multi-party software authorization from different data sources from like uh, federal, I guess, sources or any sort of like validated from a federal source identification. That makes sense to me. But something you said about social media that I thought was really interesting and like how that factors in, because recently I found out, I think it's in China, they're starting to allocate credit based on social media identity and appearance. And um, I fully don't like get how that's possible because I think there's like a lot of risk behind that and it's like very easy from a security perspective to kind of falsify identities through social media. So I'm curious if you've seen any risk behind that or if that's even a factor that's actually, um, I guess, incorporated, because I thought that was really interesting that you mentioned that. What do you do? Uh, cybersecurity. There you go. <laughs> okay, so how, how do you how do you overcome, um, we always have to ask, is like, what, what's the, the basis of it, right? So on the social media side, um, as you know, there's a lot of bots that create these social media profiles, but what do they do, right? So Matt has identified certain software that we're using, third-party software, um, one, for instance, Tune, a company called Tune, that actually tracks whether someone's real or not based on certain social media factors, right? How many friends do they have? How many comments do they do? How many likes do they get? Uh, on and on, because obviously the regular bot is gonna be very limited to how many friends they have and how many interactions they really have in social media. Are they real or are they not? The second question is that, can we see that someone's real because of their Facebook profile and can we see that they're real based on their buying habits? So what if they're buying something, let's say their income, they do a direct deposit of $2,000, but they're hanging around in Beverly Hills and they buy Louis Vuitton for $5,000. Well, they're not being financially you know, uh, responsible with their money. So we use triggers like that that says, you know, so social media is not the only trigger, obviously, but we use it to say, where's this person hanging out with? Uh, where, where are they checking in? Uh, can we see that they're actually being responsible with their money? And can we see that they're actually uh, a real person? And, and, and those factors play into it because social media can give you a, a good idea of who that person is. I mean, you look at my Amazon, you're gonna know I'm into moss walls right now, right? It's like, I bought all this <laughs> moss wall shit. So, you know, like if you wanna sell me a moss right now, I would buy moss from you because I'm building this 20 foot moss wall. So, so th those buying habits really tell you who I am, right? And it also tells you how much I'm spending, right? I'm spending way beneath my, my income level. And that means I should be good for X amount of money. So that's what we're using social media on. But on cybersecurity, that's the whole premise of decentralization. Because on cybersecurity, you can fragment a, a data, right? You can fragment the database, tokenize it, and then put it in different cloud servers and then tokenize that. Now we have true security. Because in cybersecurity, if you put it on, a, on just one database, that's a one target right there, right? Yeah. We can have DDoS attacks and everything else out there, but if we can fragment the data, tokenize the data, and then put it into different cloud servers? No, yeah, I thought that was, I actually used to do like cryptography and digital shipping shit, so I didn't know that much about blockchain, so I thought 
that, that's literally what's happening, right? And then we're having minors actually, uh, you know, verify, yeah. validate that transaction that can't be changed anymore. That's the whole goal. That answer? See, now we're getting into jargon, right? Now we're getting into the words. Go, go ahead, hit her with her word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. No, but that's, that's where it really gets interesting, right? Because the, the algorithm they use to mine is like crazy. So it gets really interesting I mean, on that side. There's totally different algorithms. There's, there's, it's a, it's a whole kind of study that's developing on its, on its own right now. Like, uh, yeah. But, but we're, we're using real world uh, banking techniques, right? Again, in the merchant service space, we use tokenization to just secure the card, so that way we're PCI compliant, AML, and KYC compliant. <sighs> right. <laughs> so I mean, think about it. You know, you, uh, you own a business. Oh, you don't? Oh, it seemed like you did. <laughs> if you use blockchain in business. And, and in most businesses, this is the problem we have with merchant services, is that they keep receipts uh, signed by their customers, which is totally against PCI compliancy, right? We came up with the smart chip on the card to make sure that they know that it's you and they can, they can uh, you know, counteract uh, counterfeit, right? But still, you know, there's people that are violating PCI laws and AML laws and KYC laws all the time. So this is closer to being more secure than that other technology. That's all we're saying. Marcel? So uh, you're coming up against an industry that's well established. Yeah. Already massive <coughs> incumbents. And they're just not going to go away very easily. I know. Except your rise into a new place in the market. So what would you say are the early signs that you've been targeted to fail? How would we be able to counter that, that by laws, uh, politicians, all that, that kind of thing? Well, and that's a great question because that, that's what we've started right now. We've started a political campaign for us. We've actually gone to Washington, D.C. and sat down with uh, – one of those for me. <laughs> uh, we, we sat down with uh, um, senators. I'm actually going to take it if you offer it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we've sat down with senators and Congress people um, to really uh, um, help out Latino initiatives, dreamers, and whatnot. But w what it boils down to is that the banks suck at customer acquisition. Let's be honest, right? If they were great marketers, we wouldn't have a shot at it. But they're not, they're terrible at marketing. Right? The banks are not open on Sunday. Think about that, guys. They're open Monday through Friday from X amount of time to 5 p.m. when we're all working, and they're not open when we're not working when we need them. Think about those business models, right? They're antiquated business models. So we're really up against 20-year-old thought patterns. So we can move faster, we can do things faster. This is guerrilla warfare. The way we look at it is that we will outrun them because we can, we're smaller, right? But as this big ship starts turning, we have to watch out for the wake. So we have to watch out for compliancy. So we have to get license, like money service business licensing laws apply to us, especially when we're doing remittance. So we have to have partners that either already have those licenses or we become that licensed entity. And because laws are, are in the banking industry are getting changed, right, because they're deregulating some of the laws now, there's new fintech laws that are, can, can help us become a bank. So one of the things we've done, for instance, is that we started talking to chairman of Royal Bank that's helped seven uh, other banks become real. So that way we can learn from them. He's becoming one of our investors. So for us, we're really looking at bringing in smarter people than us in the industry, showing them what we want to do, and then getting guided on how we can do that in mm -hmm. the middle. Not complete left, not complete right, but somewhere in the middle. So we can still be compliant with everything, right? and then go left. But if you become a, a, the problem with crypto, and I think you can agree with me, is that sometimes these guys look like, uh, and no offense if anybody does this at the airports, like the guys in the orange suits and the, air, you know, the religious people in the airports giving you something so you can give them a donation. Very religious zealots, right? And they're going, if you don't convert, you're gonna go to hell. And that's what crypto became in the very beginning. And until it became more of a business practical sense, more people started adopting it. But in the beginning, if you weren't all in on crypto and forget fiat, they thought money was gonna disappear in six months. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a just watch out for that, because that exists 
all the time, even now. You know, there are always those groups who are very like, very only Bitcoin centric. That's the only one that can exist. No other is possible. Um, just watch out for that. Got to stay in the middle. Just got to got to watch out with your lanes, and then you got to adhere to whatever government laws mm -hmm. that you're trying to do business on. I mean, you know, we were just talking about it over there in Brazil, what she's doing with her ICO. That's smart, and that's what we want to do, right? So. Just let everybody get their peace, but use technology to reduce the cost of everything and make it better, smoother, faster. That's all we're really trying to do. But it's guerrilla warfare. And, and you know, the, the customer acquisition side of it is what's gonna win. Yeah, I'll just add one more thing. I think that the, the big corporations, I think they're, a lot of them are scared. They see this technology and they see the danger that it presents to their business model. Yeah. And yes, you're right, they're not gonna go down quietly. They're gonna try to fight with every ounce they have to try to keep those profits. But a lot of these guys behind the scenes, they, they're paying a lot of money to people trying to develop their own blockchain and maybe they're not getting left behind. So it's gonna be interesting in the, in the coming years because you have, the Jamie Dimon saying, you know, saying it's a bubble of tulip mania, et cetera. And then he's got his his team behind the scenes, they're spending millions of dollars trying to make sure they're 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 up on it. They're not gonna get passed up. I yeah. even think recently Goldman Sachs is uh, they opened up a oh. legal trading desk for Bitcoin specifically. Did they? This is, this is coming from a large bank that's always been resistant to yeah. this type of stuff. He's a Goldman Sachs guy right here. Oh, sorry, Morgan Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> you have, you have, you have, uh, yeah, you guys kind of touched on this already, but with the, there's like over 1,500 different ICOs and all, all these coins out there. Mm -hmm. Is there eventually be a time where like all the players in the space are going to kind of minimize? Is there a need for consolidation? There'll, there'll be consolidation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you look at just like what happened, even from like look at last year. Yeah, I think that just came out like 47 percent of ICOs from 2017 are insolvent right now right again right because they didn't have a strong business case for the business there wasn't that acquisition not a revenue rollback for the company it wasn't a real product right it was a it was a white paper and a dream and they took the money went and bought a boat and were living in the Mediterranean Right. Dot com, nineteen ninety six all over again right like that's but that's not honestly, that ecosystem doesn't it's it's getting Investors are getting much more savvy in the space um, because of the, the volume that's going on, because of the amount of, of rhetoric in both you know crypto media as well as regular media. Um, people call BS now a lot faster, uh, and then a lot of projects aren't hitting those massive raises or minus you know eight hundred million dollars with uh, Telegram like, down out of the, out of the way. But there's there there's been you know but there will be consolidation. And if you think about it, if I'm an organization, so if company A ran their ICO, they had maybe they developed a product but couldn't get in the market. If I'm a larger company, that's an already developed blockchain. Can I just go ahead and purchase that asset and then integrate that into my existing model? Like you'll start to see, I think, more of that happen as well. Maybe not in 2018, come 2019, you'll see the Fortune 1000 start purchasing a lot of these little startups to actually add the, the innovation sector to their business so they are not bumped off. That's, I guarantee, will happen in 2019 and beyond. Is that quietly, or? Right now, I, I don't know, I know there's a couple, I look at Kodak Coin, right? They came out and <laughs> trying to get their own innovation you know, going, but I think you'll, you'll see, you'll see more coming out next year. And just to just to add to that, I think like eventually it might just phase out of like people's attentions. Like you know, even in the stock market, there are a lot of penny stocks in you know coming in, coming out, and, and nobody really cares. You care about like the big stocks that you know about. And the same way, like eventually the small ICOs, maybe they they'll, they they'll still exist, but you know like what the industry is at, and 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 at that point you people's attention will just go away. But right now it's a very novel thing and so so everybody's kind of got attention on it. And also by the way, like, cause I'm, I'm in a media piece, no one cares if you're doing an ICO. Like if you go talk to a journalist, like I don't care if you're doing an ICO. There's 1,500 ICOs going on there any given day at this point. 
So unless you really have, a, at this point, a business, a story, a reason, like, you know, a true like way to generate revenue, like there's, again, even the media now has been tampered back quite a bit from what they're putting out there because you know, they're part of that process. Again, if you're not a seasoned trader, I'm not a seasoned trader, I don't do any trading actually. I, I typically hold almost everything I have, or I have a, I have a friend who has a mining farm in Ukraine and I give him all my funds and he just, he, he trades it for me. Um, but like, yeah, that's the, you know, but there's, there's different, a lot of innovation coming out through this entire process too. But, but look at the difference, right? Um, Matt and I invested in a brewery. I just got our first dividend after two years. Two years? Two yeah. years. I got the first dividend for $300, right? Crypto still beats it, <laughs> right? No matter what we did, I mean, you know, that, that was a, a, we a, want a- We want a, a medal at the American Beer Festival. Right, <laughs> right, and we, we had all that stuff, and, yeah. and, they, and they have coffee beer. They made, they made us coffee beer, which I love. Uh, like that's the premise, I guess, in crypto. I mean, at the space, you know, fundamentally, the decentralized asset that is at its core, right? But here you have a tangible asset that can be valued for cash flow. Crypto's. Well, that's that's what we're trying to change, right? So I think the new ICOs uh, of the world should be based on cash flow, should be based on revenue, should be based on consumer um, transactions within your app. If not, then we're going to keep on having this volatility. <laughs> I think that's where, for instance, that's what we're focused on, right? We, we've already have clientele waiting for us, you know, at, at the tune of maybe a million users. So for us, we're actually looking at that going, that's what we want to announce <coughs> every month, every quarter. That way the, the up and down isn't that severe. And if we can be that example, then that's what we want to do. And I hope that every ICO is leaning into a revenue stream model with, with financial transactions as being their backbone compared to FUBAR, right? It's like, I hope, I pray, you know, I cross my fingers, and this is a novel idea, <laughs> but, but who cares? If you don't make money off of it, or you can't solve a problem, and there's no activity, you're, you know, it's a shit coin. That's, that is. Um, I think uh, Ignacio mentioned this. What will happen with when all these start getting regulated? For example, we are already reading about the IRS <coughs> trying to uh, apply taxes to basis. exactly. So, how would those regulations uh, will impact this whole um, scenario? For, for us, it's the trading houses that get regulated that. You know that makes sense, right? Because then when you pull money out, you just pay your taxes, yeah, so run it like a regular business. Yeah, so those exchanges are the centralized points in this decentralized system, right. right? There's like five or six exchanges, and they are the centralized points. All the money is flowing through there. So people are working on just decentralizing all aspects of it, and in that in that aspect, it gets really hard to regulate. But when you look at regulation, there has to be a central point. So Coinbase, no matter who has Bitcoin accounts. They all transact through Coinbase, and so you can, if you hit Coinbase, you can regulate it. But what if there was a decentralized exchange? Mm -hmm. The exchange itself was decentralized, and who do you hit now? Who do you, where, where do you go? So, I mean, it's it's still coming up, um, but but that's kind of. And, and, just and people need to be careful, right? Because they, a lot of people say, "Oh, it's anonymous." Have you? Do you guys have a Coinbase account? Because I literally had to take my picture with my ID with a sign that says, "I'm alive." And whatever, that's like a proof of life concept. It's not <laughs> anonymous. They know exactly who you are, right? So when Coinbase, the IRS says, give us that data, they got your picture, <laughs> right? And they're going, tax that guy. Just pay your taxes, right? It's, it's, yeah, I mean, you have to get it. Story. All regulation isn't bad. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, again, right? The goal is to drive out the scam, right? right. The goal is to, right. But look at the, you know, the goal of the SEC is to protect retail investors. That's why they exist. Right. It's not to you know harbor down and de you know enforce regulation on everything. They, they want they want there to be good business, right? So yeah, it's going to be part of the process, especially in the United States. Well, let, let's let's just add something to it. Uh, how many of you guys have airline mile cards? You know, cards that give you airline miles, right? Mm. That's cryptocurrency. It's the same thing. Oh, you got it, huh? Your eyes just lit up. Yes, that is cryptocurrency. And actually, you know, speaking of regulation, so Wyoming, right? They, they're probably the most blockchain forward state in the union by far. Next would be Delaware. Um, at this point, they've passed three bills now that are solely around blockchain that are getting signed into law next week. It will be the highest law regarding the definition of a utility token. 
which is they're equating them to airline miles. There Mobile top-up minutes. Right. It's the same thing. Same thing. It's a digital, that's how they're equating a digital currency. Those are our arguments, by the way, right? Yeah, but like, I mean, like, but if you but look at the feasible federal, based on another industry. If you look at the federal level from a law perspective, they look at the states to be living labs for law. So if Wyoming this goes into law, that'll probably help shape how the federal government will actually look. Like what what problems is Wyoming gonna have once it's once it's enacted? Right, where are the gaps going to be? Where, where, how can we make this better for broader adoption? As well as other governments look to us for how they should be enforcing laws and so forth. Just two quick questions. So we usually hear about the Delaware company that's like really close together. Do you think that Wyoming is going to have that? And yeah, yeah. So they, they have they have their Wyoming. You can incorporate in Wyoming on the blockchain just like you can in Delaware. So mm -hmm. Delaware, they moved their corporate services to the blockchain several months ago, um, where they when they form a Delaware LLC, it actually goes on a blockchain in the state of Delaware. Second question is just unrelated. So we are in the business of representing Latinos in the careers and empowering them. Uh, what would I tell a student who is getting to college or just finishing college as far as a career? Like I want to be in the cryptocurrency world. I want to work in a company and does this. What are the career options aside from being entrepreneur? This is for a company. What are the career paths that they can they can start now? Talk about it. Program. Learn programming. Learn finance. What are they? I mean, for us, we're we're always looking for programmers, right? I mean, we're incubating a lot of uh, people that can be programmers. Um, we hire uh, in Mexico. Uh, one of our major scenarios is that we have a satellite office in uh, the capital of Mexico and we have eight programmers there and then we have other programmers in the Ukraine. So they're learning from each other, but we're doing hackathons now to teach the youth how to program in blockchain mythology, right? How do you, how do you actually think through a process because programmers can really figure this out. It's the same, same job opportunities here in San Francisco or the same job opportunities uh, for uh, Latinos, um, you know, in, in the blockchain world, programming, uh, social media, uh, design, animation, UI, UX, all that is still relevant, right? Uh, finance, fintech is just a good industry. You know, we got a couple of fintech, you know, people here, but it's a good industry because it's one that can use this technology to really empower them. So. You know, are you in cybersecurity? Can you bring in cybersecurity know-how from the general industry and bring it over here and decentralize it? You know, these are things where you can start using it. Are you great at customer service? Because you know, those type of things you can you can use. For for our culture, um, we're still Latinos. We still speak Spanish. Anything you can speak Spanish on is going to be a, a plus. You know, for for decentralized or blockchain you know, companies that are Latin based. I think the biggest problem with Latinos is we don't know our own power, right? Uh, you, you look at the, the uh, Israel, right? The, they get money from the United States and they use almost 50% of it in new startups. Where in Mexico's case, uh, and I think uh, Leap Global you know, did some numbers where they were showing that only 1% or 2% of all uh, investment into Mexico goes into new startups. That's bullshit. You know, we have such great talent in, in Mexico mm -hmm. and over here, cross border, right? You look at any, where, where a lot of Latinos are, you'll find Latino programmers, you'll find uh, Latino directors, Latino, you know, content providers. So like, uh,